Hello, Edley? Yes, Pete. How you doing? All right, how are you? I'm great. Um, well, this is another uh, episode of Suburban Rebels broadcast with Ed Leo Dowd of okay. Toilet Boys, um, Psychic TV, and Scorpion T. Um, so what was life growing up like in uh, New York, and how did you become like an artist and musician? Well, I grew up in New York in the late 80s. Um, I don't know. Things were pretty different then. Um I guess in a different way than they are today. It was pre-internet. <laughs> so there was a lot of flyering. There was a lot of going out to see, you know, like what it was without knowing anything about it, you know. So the the possibilities were different in that way. And um, so it drew me as a high school student. I was like, that's where I want to be. And that's where I went. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Um, and how did you end up in the toilet, boys? Toilet Boys was an interesting, almost kind of accident because I had decided really early on that I didn't want to play music anymore. And I had been in this band. It was a lot of aggravation and fighting and all this stuff. And my, uh, my become friends with Miss Guy who called me up and said, Hey, you know, I'm doing a one night gig for opening for Debbie, Debbie Harry. Do you want to, do you want to be my drummer? And I was like, sure. Okay. And then literally like, <laughs> day after the gig the phone started ringing with offers and it was like that set us on a 10-year path that we did not expect you know right uh was the toilet boys your first band it was my first band that actually you know had like did anything more than the usual right like um i was in bands i've been in bands since i was 15 played gigs all that kind of stuff but toilet boys was the first thing that broke through and kind of like a a more national than international way. Oh, okay. Uh, and what about art? How did you start making art? As a kid, right? Like what, pre-internet. Right. <laughs> we read books and we made art. <laughs> you know? So it was a very, you know, from a very early age, it was kind of just like that sort of interest in drawing and all that kind of stuff. And so I think I started when I was around 11 and it just evolved from there, you know. Okay. And what were the uh, early to- Toilet Boys shows like? <laughs> they were a hoot. I mean, initially it was funny, you know, because it was just sort of like wild punk rock or whatever. But when Sean Pierce joined the group about maybe a year and a half after we started, because again, it wasn't really meant to be a band. We didn't We didn't have any like firm idea of what we wanted to do. But when Sean joined the group, he had been in another band that was using a lot of pyro and he started introducing that and then fire breathing and all this stuff. And the show just got crazier and crazier. But in the beginning, when we'd play and we'd have pyro, it was literally black gunpowder in a coffee can with wires underneath (laughs) it. And those would get plugged in by somebody standing on the side of the stage. (laughs) the amount of burns and, and injuries that we've all sustained over the years is kind of amazing. But, you know, and then with the advent of Great White having that fire in 2021 or whatever it was and people being afraid of pyro, we just we were like, we're not doing that anymore. It's too dangerous. Yeah. And uh, did shows get shut down a lot because of that? They did. I mean, the it was unfortunate because the... The Great White Show happened while we were on tour in Europe. Um, we had just come off tour with the Red Hot Chili Peppers doing an arena tour. Mm-hmm. And we were then doing a week of of, of like our own headlining shows. Mm-hmm. So we arrived in Portugal where we had a really great following. I mean, we would get thousands. And we arrived for our show after that story broke about Great White. And 75 people showed up. Mm-hmm. Wow. So it was sort of the beginning at the end at that point, you know, which is fine. It's kind of like it's it's led us to where we are now, which is we do gigs once in a while and we have a great time and that's that. It's, there's no pressure. Right. And how was uh, the tour with the Chili Peppers? Anything interesting happened there? They, it was a very formative experience for all of us. Like nobody had been on an arena tour, such a different animal um, and so disconnected 
in a way, because when you're playing a club, it's super visceral and like people are sweating and you can feel them, you know, when you play an arena, the closest person is like 50 feet away. <laughs> yeah. So it's cool, but it's a little more mechanical because you don't, you don't get that vibe with the audience. You know what I mean? Right. But you- Chili Peppers are super, super nice guy. I mean, they were so, so great, gener- generous to us, you know? Um, so we're really, you know, happy that we got to do it. Yeah, that's cool. What was the uh, wildest Toilet Boys show, you think? <laughs> the wildest could have been there was definitely some violence um you know we i remember one time years ago we got attacked on stage in california and that was like you know ro- i mean people it was just nuts blood and people getting thrown around and i was like why <laughs> over what wow. but i guess some people were really freaked out by us and you know decided that they were gonna i don't know show us you know what I mean? yeah. did so you guys then, did you get ahead. out of there or did you fight back or we did like i you know i personally didn't because i was behind the drums and it wasn't you know it was just kind of like i was in shock really but the um but sean yeah i mean sean had to like physically hit somebody it was kind of awful you know because the guy he was trying to pull our singer in by the microphone cord oh wow. and um you know, it's it's sort of. I, I think people also don't understand like what's involved in a show like that. It looks like it it's a particular thing, but you got a like a frail person wearing really tall heels, all this fire going on. It's like you might not want to get on the stage. <laughs> yeah. 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 So but, you know, and then sometimes people like you know, Sean would be fire breathing, and some like, people would raise their hands. It's like no. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Were the Toilet Boys a nonstop party, would you say? Um, I'd say, yeah. I mean, in in their world, yeah. You know, like, I was always the guy who went to bed early. (laughs) (laughs) And then that changed when Psychic TV, you know, happened. And what was the New York City, like, punk experimental scene like? At that time? Right, at the time after, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 90s, you know, experimental, I I don't really, I wasn't that tapped in in the 90s, um, you know, as as far as seeing performances. But I mean, you know, listening to records was more what I did. But in the 90s, the punk scene was very, I don't know. It's funny how um, these certain decades come back into vogue, you know, pop will eat itself. It's always that way. But having... I don't know, been very active in the 90s. When I look at 90s culture coming back, my thought is why? (laughs) So I have a different slant on it. It's like there was a lot of fun stuff going on and lots and lots of different factions and scenes and all this kind of stuff. But coming from 80s punk, you know what I mean? And going to CBGBs every Sunday for hardcore matinees, it was so much. And now in, you know, like now 20 years later, it's even more. Right. But so there's that 90s style of like really bright colors and kind of like hokey graphics and all that kind of stuff that I never really was into. Yeah, that's true. And uh, how did you meet Genesis Peoridge? So Genesis um, ended up marrying my very first girlfriend um, who... Um, in 1984 was when she and I were together, Lady J. Mm. And um, so, you know, it was just like a, there's a huge history to that friendship because we were, you know, high school sweethearts or whatever, but then we became amazing friends as adults, you know, into our adulthood. And one day she called me and she goes, I'm I'm leaving for California. Um, The person I want to marry has been in a terrible accident and I don't know when I'll be back. Um, I didn't know she was talking about Genesis. She didn't relay that to me. Um, but it turned out that Genesis was in a house fire that um, Rick Rubin owned. Oh, wow. Right. He was um, recording Love and Rockets in Rick Rubin's home studio. And the house caught on fire and Genesis had to jump from the top floor of the house. And shattered their arm in like 17 places and all this kind of stuff. So 
this is, you know, so a couple of years later when Jackie came home, you know, she came over and you know, she's like, yeah, my partner's here. Everything's cool. Um, you know, everything's going well. Can't wait for you all to meet. I go back inside to my apartment. This is when there were still answering machines. Right? So I play the tape and it's Genesis looking for Jackie, right? Not knowing who I was, but just that I'm this guy, Eddie, that she knows or Edley or whatever I was at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, so I thought, I don't, I literally wouldn't want to make this person wait. And I still didn't know it was Genesis. So I called the number and we ended up staying on the phone for an hour. And we had lunch like two days later. And then it just kind of went from there. We were just like fast friends. But we didn't play a note of music together until, I don't know, at least two years after we were, like, really good friends. Oh, okay. And it was never really on my mind. It was just, like, Genesis was doing a lot of spoken word stuff, you know, new ventures in art and music and stuff. And But because Toilet Boys were born at this club called Squeezebox, where it was kind of like a weekly gay mixed, you know, freakazoid night but very rock and roll oriented. And usually at two o'clock in the morning, something special would happen, whether it was like a famous drag queen singing live rock songs, Mm -hmm. you know, to some famous person showing up and and doing a short set or whatever. And I said to Genesis, I was like, there's something to that. I said, I'd love to get you up there and just do four psychic TV songs because I think people would really dig it. And Jim said, no, no, nobody really cares about that anymore. I don't care about it, blah, blah, blah. I was like, dude, if you get up there and you sing Roman P, Godstar, you know, Unclean, and just like Arcadia, people are going to lose their minds. Right. And so Jen agreed to do it, but then it took the form of us making our own band to do it as a gig, as like a full concert, and we really were just planning to do it once. Oh, okay. And that turned into 15 years. <laughs> And what were the uh, psychic TV shows like? Like, I think initially they were pretty punk rock, you know, because we had so many ideas and we were so excited. And Genesis was so excited to be like back in their new body, all this stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'd say from the outset, it was kind of like a bit more aggressive. But as time went on and different you know, different people came to play with us and all that kind of stuff. We eventually evolved into this very psychedelic, epic, swirling thing that kind of Jen and I always imagined we could, but it just took finding the right players to kind of get there. Oh, okay. And um, and so then the mu- like the saw the the new music they were we were writing started to evolve and change and all that stuff over time. So I mean, fifteen years was a, a nice run to be able to really try a lot of different things. Right. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? You're breaking up a tiny bit. Oh, okay. I, I think it's because I'm moving, so I'm going to stay still. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think drugs are like a necessity and in creative influence? Absolutely not. That's that's my, my stance. But, I mean, other people would say differently. I'm sure Genesis would say differently, you know, but that just kind of was never really – I always found it to be, I don't know, like, not that it would cause inhibition, but it, that it was more like it might take me away from what I truly could do if I did it sober. Right. Yeah. And what influences you to create music? I can't stop. <laughs> it's, I just can't stop. I get to I guess music for me is my drugs. It's like I hear things, I get super excited about them. I have like physical symptoms from this. I'll get dizzy. It's you know. So it, it that's what keeps me going is just like the the result of it, just like a trial and error experimenting and making something and going that sucks, throw it away, keep that, rework that. You know, I mean just a pro- constant process. What what do you think the wildest psychic TV show was? Mm, there's a there's definitely a few, but there was one in Berlin at the Volksbühne where it seemed like an orgy seemed to break out in in a section of the crowd. Oh. And uh, 
And that was a hoot because it was a theater. So we had, it was like we were watching the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what are your beliefs on occultism? I don't really have any. I mean, you know, that's that's really more Jen's department with that sort of thing. Like, I love to hear about it. I love to read, experiment, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's not something that I feel is under invention. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, because I was going to ask what uh, Topi was all about. Yeah, that was an aspect of, of Jen's work that I really was not involved with. I see. Okay. We were really much more focused on sound and, and visual and stuff like that. But the, the kind of more like propaganda end of it, it was, was something that we we had discussed. And over the years, I did make things. Like there was a point where Jen really wanted to bring back like Topi with a Y instead of an I, right? No, no, sorry. Topi with an I instead of a Y. So not psychic youth but psychic individuals so jen had at different points i mean (laughs) jen had it good in a way because there was an an in-house designer in me so jen could just call and say make me something (laughs) and which i I often did you know and um but but again it was just you know just sort of preparing the visuals not really something that i was in the know about Mm mm-hmm and did you make uh, most of the psychic TV videos after you joined? No, I, I did all of the, um, nearly all of the, the graphics, mm. but no no actual videos. Video is like a new foray for me. And um, so, yeah, I'm definitely going to be making some for Scorpion T. <laughs> oh, cool. And how did you get your, uh, how do you get your ideas like to create your art? I guess just from experience, right? Like I live in the country now, which is a very different experience from the 30 years that I've spent in New York City. Um, There's so much different kinds of stimulation out here. So a lot of the inspiration just comes from walking around, looking, hearing, smelling, you know, and then things will just start popping and I go into my studio and create. And uh, how was your exhibit at Lethal Amounts? That was so great. I really would love to do that again. Um, big, uh, quite a big project undertaking, but it did go really well. People loved that book. I still get asked for the book. There was only 300 printed, um, but you know, maybe in the future there'll be something. You know. But it was nice to. It was really nice with that exhibit to be able to show a different camera angle of the work itself instead of it just being album covers and this and that. It was like seeing it big on the wall, I think kind of had a different impact Mm -hmm. and spoke a different language. And, you know, Genesis had a lot to say about it um, at the opening and also in the introduction to the book. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever, if you ever saw that, but I can, I can share a PDF of the intro if you'd like to see that. Great, yeah, it would. Uh, is the book totally sold out? Yeah, they're they're gone. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I still get emails for people saying, how can I get it? You know, right. there'll be a, you know, an occasional eBay um, auction or whatever. They're out there. Um, right. But, yeah, it's just a matter of, of, like, a repress at some point down the line. Okay. And how long were you in uh, Kailasa? I was in Kailasa for about... Like it was under a year, all that activity, okay. but it was, wow, super, super busy. It was like the, I got the call. My son had turned me on to Kailasa mm-hmm. and um, it was, it became my cycling music that summer. I was just like, oh, this is like full of energy, you know? Wow. And, you know, so then over the years I, t- I took my son to see them, you know, we, we met them or whatever. And very strangely, you know, cause I had, once I had said to them, if you ever need a drummer, because I love their whole two drummer thing. And I was like, that would be a fun gig to do. And sure enough, I get a call. And um, we need you in Savannah in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so there I went. I just, I, you know, dove had long into it. And it was an amazing experience. I mean, we did so many gigs over the course of three months. Mm-hmm. And, you know, metal festivals in Europe where people just absolutely lose
lose their minds. I mean, that's, for me, it's all about like, where is that going to happen? Like there was some Kailesa gigs in, at metal festivals that were just, I'll never forget them. Psychic TV in Russia, I will never forget, you know, like those shows were beyond. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And uh, why did you start Scorpion T? Well, after Genesis, uh, you know, passed away, I needed something new to do and wasn't sure what I was going to do. So I started doing solo music. And uh, last May, a friend of mine who lives in Colombia called me and said, I'd love for you to play drums on this new album I did. And um, so we managed to get me to Colombia, recorded these drums. He played me a bunch of new music. And I was like, this is what I've wanted to do for the last, you know, since Jen passed. But I haven't been able to find anybody who gets what I'm talking about. So within, I don't know, five weeks, we were in the studio. <laughs> Oh, it's exciting meeting for him. He's actually returning to the U.S. next month so we can start rehearsing for gigs. Oh, cool. And where did you get um, all the cuts of the people talking? Like, it sounds like one of them was from, like, a talk show about punks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's the, the solo stuff we're talking about. Yeah. Right. It, it really, it, it, there's there's a lot of special ones in there. There's ones of people that I know that are kind of, buried in there it's like if we are going to talk about magic or whatever it's those the solo things the compositions each one is essentially a sigil oh, okay right so it, it contains elements that you know to me together would cause like some sort of response in somebody oh, okay so the one with the punks talking i just thought was funny because they're so like it it's just so the, different from what we experience now yeah people talking about those kinds of subjects or whatever i mean it's the same but it's different but they just seemed really kind of lackluster and a little the whole thing seemed a little vanilla and i just thought it would be fun to work with that right um and what made you use like uh the revving car sounds those were recorded in india oh. and um so a lot of i i sort of record a lot of things when I travel and um that was on the back I was on the back of my friend's motorcycle and I just kind of took out the recorder and just let it go. Oh cool. I love that song. Um and what do you think you've ever been possessed while making music? <laughs> yes. <laughs> possessed, <laughs> you know, might be one word, but but for sure, like locked in, uh, altered other, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when I record it too, you know, I tend to do a lot of like rocking back and forth and all that kind of stuff. Right. <clears throat> Are you moving again? You're breaking up a little bit. Yeah. Let me let me sit down again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And how did you end up signing to Give and Take Records? That was a night like a lucky situation um i was seeking a label for scorpion t talking to a few and i started working with a publicist named dan who has a company called discipline pr and uh he actually led me to give take and it was um kind of the perfect thing to happen you know i wasn't even aware of them they're so into the record they're so supportive it's like this is the best place for us to be uh, okay and what what will be the first single? Uh, yeah, that's gonna come out. Uh, the first single will be called "In a Vile Suit." Okay, nice. And when does that come out? Uh, it's gonna be May or June. We're still uh, we're literally finishing the mixes today, so mastering's next, and then um, you know decisions after that. But if we have it the way we want it, it will be um, first single will be. May and then one single a month until the album comes out in October. Great, cool. What do you think the ultimate goal is of Scorpion T? I think the ultimate goal is to really sort of experiment with new sounds. The record that we made um, is very much a rock record, but it has sort of psychedelic elements that could only be achieved through analog recording. Right. 
Um, okay. So there's a lot of use of outboard effects and, um, you know, just interesting methods of making sound. Okay. And a lot of the music goes with visuals too, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, and what what does like uh, punk rock and experimental and art mean to you? Well, it to me that is the that is the way to actually make something happen, right? Is to sort of have more of an experimental or punk rock ethos that we're not striving for perfection, we're striving for something that moves us. Mm -hmm. And those two scenes are very much about that. And And uh, what do you think is next for Scorpion T? Are you guys going to do a tour or working on it? Working on it right now. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, you know it's all happening at once, so it's kind of like I haven't even thought that far ahead. Yet. I'm still trying to get the record out, but yeah, I mean we're looking for we're currently looking for an agent, and um, so we can start booking shows and tours. Right. Hopefully, you come to San Francisco. Oh yeah, I wasn't sure where you were located, so that's where you are. Yeah, right now I'm on uh, a street in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. Oh, okay. <laughs> in my car, yeah. Yeah, um, we um, I think I think San Francisco would be good for Scorpion T, and like, and vice versa. Yeah, for sure, definitely. And uh, if you could say anything to Genesis right now, what would it be? I miss you. Nice. Do you have any last words? I don't. Thank you for, for your interest. I'm I'm excited. Thank you for doing the interview, Edley. I yeah. appreciate it. Have a great right. day. You too. Bye-bye now. Bye.